Bop, 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 bop. Dear Diary, just wrapped up this crazy season, got this gig, God knows if it's going to get renewed, some weird plot about jellyfish and the sun, I guess it was okay, I'm going to go look at some scripts for some Esperanto movies. I wish I was doing more Twilight Zone. Sincerely, William Shatner, 37 years old. No, you're no, you're wrong. Hi, everyone. Welcome again to Yelling at Gaseous Anomalies. I'm your host, Captain Matthew Ross, accompanied by my non-singing host, Michael Pontone and XO. How are we doing tonight, Mike? I can't believe you would say that. Not <laughs> Well, no, it's good. It's just, I mean, hey, listen, Captain, I'm I'm excited. Honestly, this episode it was pretty neutral, but um, it was it didn't blow me away. It didn't disappoint me. It's kind of like ending on a whimper. But um, let me tell you, I sure am happy that we've come to the to the conclusion, our first big milestone. We've got to the end of the first season, we and sure that have. feels like a big deal for me. It is a big deal. This is the this is the last episode of season one. According to the book, it's episode 29, but we've already gone through that several times. This is our episode 28, but it's uh, quite a milestone. Look at that. Woohoo! We guess we should have some champagne or, I don't know, some uh, food cubes or something to celebrate. Mm, but, delicious. I said, give me the brandy! But uh, tonight's episode is Operation Annihilate, one of the few Star Trek episodes with punctuation, with an exclamation point specifically. Annihilate! <laughs> and uh, we had some, and flying egg monsters, as I like to think of them. This is actually a, a weird one. Well, they're all kind of weird. It's a kind of a sort of body horror thing yeah. that uh, other shows take on, like aliens taking over the human body. You could say it's the puppet masters. You could say, if you want to get more modern, it's the uh, flood from Halo. You didn't play Halo, have you? I did not know, although I'm going to, I, I guess we'll get into it. You keep going. I, I'm going to tell you what they exactly reminded me of. It's a very deep, deep cut, okay. Star Trek deep cut, but go ahead. Well, this is, I mean, it, you could see these things with the aliens taking over humans and other places, but this starts off with, they're trying to get to the den of a colony, a colony that's been in place for a hundred years, a specifically a human colony, and they've lost contact with it, the uh, Federation. So the Enterprise has been dispatched to take a look at what's going on it's considered a, pa a paradise uh and they supply minerals and other things and scotty's even done a mineral well uh, a mineral run here uh and uh spock is pointing out to a chart saying there's like a path of insanity that archaeologists have noticed from solar system to solar system and denov was the next in in line um so they must have sent out a expedition or two to the dead solar systems makes you wonder what happened what did they find in those planets and mm -hmm. they've lost all contact they can't reach anyone kirk uh, is confused and that's when we see a spaceship flying into the sun now this is the remastered uh, version you didn't actually see it but in this version you could see the uh, a little tiny spaceship flying directly into the sun i thought that was some pretty cool effects we hear the pilot of the Denovan spaceship screaming, I'm free! And then, boom, it explodes. I did it. It's finally gone. I'm free. As the Enterprise is chasing it towards the sun. I actually like this open, this cold open, if you will, or hot open, because it's close to the yeah, sun. Yeah, about to say, pretty hot open here. <laughs> pretty dark. What, what did you think about it? Now, by the way, the entire episode is dark, and uh, it's got big Very, it. very rough, dude. Yeah, very scary. Yeah. But, but uh, that was my favorite part of the opening. This was actually written by the former story editor, Stephen Karabatsis. Part of his contract was that he got to write something, so they released him from a story editing contract, and DC Fontana took over, and Stephen Karabatsis wrote this. It was way darker than this. I could just t the, tell you what this was on. This had yeah, please, give me the pitch. The eight rewrites, Kirk has to destroy and kill everyone on the planet because they can't find a cure. That's kind of dark, actually, if you think. That's very Jeez. more than very dark um, because they can't find a cure. There was another version where uh, they actually blind everyone on the planet, which is we'll come to that as we go along, and then they send a small crew to send, like, eye surgery on every person on this planet. So... 
There's lots of dark things over here. But yeah, Kara- I like I like the, the very kind of like terror aspect of it. I mean, first of all, Captain, do you want to start off with a uh, with a plot synopsis? Well, I will be more than happy to start off with a plot synopsis. It is from the NBC press release from March twenty seven, March twenty second, nineteen sixty seven. The USS Enterprise attempts to stem an epidemic of mass insanity that has already destroyed several planet colonies in Operation Annihilate on the NBC television network Star Trek, arriving on planet Deneva, which appears to be in the path of a spreading malady. Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock find Kirk's sister-in-law Aurelian and his nephew Peter in a near-crazed condition and learns that his brother, a biologist, has already died. Once... Yeah, I yep. didn't like that part. Well, I they... mean, okay. They right off the bat, mm-hmm. I, I'm about to say, something has been chopped up here. Why would they include Spock's brother if he's just going to be a red shirt? You, you like mean uh, Kirk's bon- Kirk, Kirk's Sorry, bon- sorry, Kirk's brother. Well, they wanted to have a human element into it. That's one of the things that they did to change the story. This was actually a hodgepodge of various ideas, but Karabatsis wanted to make a, a story about uh, an existential fre- threat and also aliens taking over humans, so that's it, but... Some things like Return of the Archons, a piece was over here, if you recall uh, from what I described before. They had Sulu taking over the ship. Spock here tries to take over the ship. The original idea was is that they, when the crew beams down to the planet to discover what's going on, they were at the communication center and they ran into two people, a woman named Aurelian and a man named Menem. And they were only the only two left holding out because the aliens hadn't gotten into them. And they describe how uh, the person who escaped was Menon's son. uh, And basically, they're going to have to kill everybody on the planet in order to stop the infestation of what's going on. But I like the way they did it here instead. So, but what do you think of that original uh, original plot? Um, Fine. Again, this seems like it was chopped up a lot. I mean, it had it had a couple of different many uh, a couple of different elements that seemed pretty terrifying and cool, but it just seemed like they started like I don't know twenty or thirty different little plots, and um, there's no particular reason why they abandoned them. I I, I, I don't know, Captain. We should get into it because I'm a little confused, honestly. All right, well, so they come to the planet, and they decide to beam down, but there's nobody around. That's the weirdest thing. By the way, this is a really cool campus. It's the TRW, now Northrop Grumman uh, Defense and Space Lab. This is actually, I wrote down what it actually does now, and yes, I have visited visited it once. But the TRW campus where this is, which was also used, that's why it looks kind of futuristic, because it's uh, for, was for the space program and technology. It's still used for that. It is specific for making a process of heterojunction bipolar transistor and transistor monoliths and microwave and millimeter wave integrated circuits, which, of course, like I used to do in my old job. But that's what that campus is designed to do. So missile technology and other things. Yes. That I just thought that was like UCLA. Now it's private company. It looked well, like a university. It was part of a university, but it is uh, was TRW that was a defense contractor, and now it's part of Northup. Um, they do have a campus that's connected to UCLA on it, but that everything you saw there is was part of the space program area. It was actually pretty cool, I thought. Yeah, it looks beautiful. Looks like a, a fantastic. I mean, listen, I love uh, the cardboard styrofoam rock sound stages, but it's just it always looks so much better when they get out of the studio and go to a local L.A. spot yeah. to shoot something in person on, on an actual, you know, with actual buildings. And they look so good walking around, you know, in their respective colors and uh, seeing what's what. Yes. It, it, it's also so futuristic looking. You would never mm-hmm. know. It's like, you think they built this whole thing? No, it's an actual place. Uh, again, that was used in the original 1978 version of Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, it's kind of weird. They're wandering around. And by the way, those of you who watch the short of the bloopers, you get to see that people are suddenly running towards them, screaming, get away, we don't want to hurt you. We don't want to kill you. Don't run away. And then Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and Scotty, they all shoot their phasers at these guys to knock them out. They're saying, "What? what's going on with that? That's, that's kind of very strange. 
in the outtake, uh, they when they yelled "cut," they pretended their their phasers were razors or phaser razors. <laughs> yes, that's, that's pretty funny. Anyway, they they go into the main lab area, where is where Kirk's brother is, and they see three people on the floor. One of them is his sister in law, Kirk's sister in law, Aurelian. The other one is his nephew, Peter. And then there is the body of his brother, Sam, who actually is William Shatner with a mustache. But that that is. Are you serious? Yeah, that is William Shatner with a mustache because they didn't have an extra. So I always think Get it's kind of the funny. heck out of here. Now, that's funny. If you watch Strange New Worlds. Uh, of course, he has a mustache. That so little he, skinny yes, the Yes, uh, that porn stash. Yes. But I that's that's something I've always first I thought was that's got to be a different actor. But if you look really carefully and you notice it is the same person. So those the other, cheap bastards. Well, the other thing that's humorous to me is, is or where the writers kind of forgot in, in editing. Uh, Sam has two boys. Uh, he only has one here. So that's that's Peter. And where do we learn that? Why in your favorite episode with the uh, styrofoam phallus, what a little girl's made of because the robot Kirk says, oh, yes, Sam. When he has two kids, so look at that. Well, you know, he could have had he could have an older kid who's someplace else. Mm. You know, I mean, that kid was like what twelve. He could have had an eighteen year old who's, you know, on a freighter someplace. That's true, but uh, but that's not that's not it. The this the Peter, by the way, that actor comes back later. Craig uh, Hurley, he comes back mm-hmm. later as the uh, leader of a group of children thugs in a. Really terrible third season episode called Miri Part Two, and the children shall lead. I mean, Miri Part Two would be better than this. But as they're finding that this person's dead, his brother's dead. uh, McCoy, Kirk, Aurelian—that's his uh, sister-in-law—and Peter get beamed up to the ship, and this is where we find out our first inkling that something is going on. That's where we get. Well, before we get there, Captain, hold the phone. I will say that you know, obviously, ever since Yeoman Rand. There's been a kind of rotating uh, scene of Yeomans, all pretty cool, all pretty cute. This Yeoman is the most attractive one there is. And I looked her up, and she's got a one name, like Zendaya. Who is this woman? You tell me. She doesn't me. have any credits anywhere else. No, that's it. She probably did stage work. What's her name, Mike? Mushaika? What was it? Hold on. Yes, Mushaika. Something like that. Yeah, she was... Mariska. Mariska. Yeah, she's pretty cute. Yeah, it's the only time you see her, you know. Uh, I think they were trying to match Yeoman from Taste of Armageddon, because she's also Asian. But, yeah, they're, bo- uh, they're both Mariska cute. Mariska looks African-American to me. Oh, well, maybe she's a mix. Who? It doesn't matter. She does her job of standing there and shooting her phaser and having one or two lines. So... That's that's it. By the way, the actress who plays Aurelian, I just want to just jump ahead. She was basically hired because she could scream well. I find that. <laughs> oh, by the way, she's Moroccan. So oh, so there we she's go. Technically African, but yeah, no, well, not it's, quite. It's it's fine. It doesn't matter where you're from. That's the way I like it. But uh, what did you think of uh, uh, the rest of that? I mean, I know you like the set. They get beamed up to the ship. What did you think of what happened to Aurelian, played by Joan Swift, hired for her screaming Again, ability? Very dark. I don't know why they're they're kind of going so dark and making it so personal for Kirk, because it doesn't affect anything. Like, he just shrugs it off. And it's not like later on, I mean, spoilers in the episode, his, you know, surrogate brother Spock is going to be in danger of dying. It, it seemed like that, again, a half-baked idea. Like, maybe if he had gotten there... And he had linked up with his brother and they had some scenes together and he was trying to and then he lost him like that would have a little bit more weight. But um, yeah. Anyway, listen, we get right into these. uh, Wait, I just want to point out to you because you're right. You know, the more emotional or tie is actually between Kirk and Spock where Spock's saying, are you okay?" And Kirk's like, yeah, yeah. But, you know, he's not. So. Captain, I understand how you. Yes. Yes, Mr. Spock. But I know, there's... but I mean, here's the thing. This is what I kind of love about Star, you know, Star Trek, and this is why I we don't like modern Star Trek because um, Starfleet officers are compassionate and humanitarian, but they're not emotional. They deal with death every day and they shrug it off for the most part. Um, and you know, if you look at the episodes from where where they thought that Data had died uh, in TNG, Picard's like, "All right, I need a new tactical. Who's up?" And 
the the episode where uh, Ensign Rowe and Jordy they think that they both die, but really they're just phased out in a different plane of existence. Mm-hmm. They get on pretty pretty quickly. You know what I mean? Yeah, that that's uh, the most toys in the next phase. Yes, that you mean they have a sense of professionalism as opposed to the uh, screaming affirmations of most new right. Trek. Uh, well, although again, it's not to say that humanity is cold. It's just that these are astronauts they they took a dangerous job they're elites and they know that uh you know they might be on borrowed time but you know they, they don't have to be elites even military even when they lose uh people that are close to them they still do their jobs they're professionals it's 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 a difference between professionalism and playing an actor trying to pretend to be something which is of the problem with a lot of modern star trek it's more written like a ya novel of like oh my god I've got this, which is the phrase that they say every 20 seconds, and then they start to cry. But I know. getting back to the uh, sick bay, we hear the uh, we hear Aurelian screaming, and this is where we find out the dark reason what's going on about some creatures came on a freighter and took them over to use them as arms and legs. This is kind of like a little bit like Invaders from Mars. It is like uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. It is like the Puppet Masters and I'm sure there's a Babylon 5 episode also where creatures take over uh, people's bodies, both keepers, and I forget the other ones, but you guys can take a look at it up. But what did you think about her explanation of what was going on on the planet? When she answers questions, any questions, it's as if she's fighting to get the answers out, as though something is exerting pain to stop her. They use it to control us. They're spreading, Jim. They need us to be their arms and legs. Forcing us to build ships for them. It's very creepy. Um, they they look creepy. They look scary and dangerous. Um, they're apparently everywhere. I don't like that they don't have any sort of personality. That they could just they're not like evil. They're just like gross, man. Mm-hmm. It's just like a disease, mm-hmm. but like a macro disease. It reminded me of one thing from Trek and one thing not from Trek. The not from Trek. Um, it reminded me of like, did you see? Uh, of course you did. Um, Donald Pleasant's Fantastic Voyage. Oh, I love that. <laughs> me too. They were, it, I, and I would w- watch it as a kid, and I always got freaked out by the white blood cells that would melt mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Looked vaguely like that, and also um, the episode. Uh, one of my favorite episodes of TNG. Uh, I think it's Phantasms, where uh, Data has the nightmares. Yes. That- and then they realize that there are like these weird sucking things on them. Oh yes, yes, that, they, that's right. They, they look vaguely like that. I don't know if they were inspired by this episode. Uh, I didn't say that. That uh, this is uh, when we when Kirk beams down. Kirk and the landing party discover a room filled with like uh, 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 weird looking creatures over there. Uh, they look like eggs to me. Uh, in some weird way, they look like flying eggs because they dive at them and so forth. Yeah, they they are weird looking. Uh, James Doohan called them flying omelets, by the way. So, yeah. that, but uh, I I actually like the the effect. I know they do they do look like uh, wet glycerinized plastic, but that's the line that the uh, yeoman says that doesn't even look real. Yes, it doesn't actually look real at all, but it is kind of creepy in like a cheesy B sci fi kind of way. It's something that you would kind of expect. Uh, but mm-hmm. I do like the way what they're doing. The original idea was is that the creature would land on a person and it would, like, fade into them. But that cost a lot of money. So, Fontana- that, so okay, <laughs> yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, what's the deal? Did they get injected with something? It seems like they're all infected. That was kind of exactly what I was expecting to see from how it's later described. Yeah, I was just he- like, are they, like, metaphysically in- infecting everything, everyone? No, it actually McCoy discovers it, but that was also Fontana's idea originally. Carabats has had it where it would just like melt into a person. So yeah. what they did is, and what you discover later, because Spock is hitting the back, and by the way, in the blooper, he's hitting the butt. So so they had to do that several times. So when it get hits him in the back, it injects something, kind of like the egg sac aliens or the crawlers from Alien, the uh, Ridley Scott movie. So Alien puts, like, a stinger in him. Even McCoy says when they get up there, these things inject you with something, and it takes over your body, and it intertwines with your spinal cord and everything else. 
I actually uh, like that little scene there is because as McCoy is operating on Spock, who is now infected, uh, Chapel's giving him lip, and he's pretty much saying to them, be quiet or get somebody else. I actually thought that was like, yeah, you go, McCoy. Nurse. Doctor, that's not all you're going to do. Miss Chapel. Doctor, there is more of it in him entwined all through his body. Miss Chapel, if you cannot assist me as required, call another nurse in here. But do one or the other now. I actually kind of yeah. like that, you know, but they're both I, I, I think that the entire crew is very well utilized. I really liked uh, that that Scotty kind of was the person with maybe some vague experience with this type of thing before. At the very least, they're using they're relying on his expertise. Um, mm. And I like the whole takeaway that Spock, like subtly, is going through this episode in intense, freakish pain, but not showing it. Yes. Because he's a Vulcan, and he even says, he goes, I know no pain, and he's, like, fighting it. I am a Vulcan. There is no pain. Uh, that, that's actually, though, what the first time is, is Spock takes over the ship, or tries to, and you see he took, like, the entire bridge crew and a, an injection of something to take him down. I thought that was yeah. awesome. But that's, Powerful boy. That was what uh, Sulu was supposed to do in Return of the Archons, uh, although I think they would probably be able to take out... Uh, swashbuckling yeah. uh, Sulu a little bit faster. <laughs> that was actually pretty cool. But, uh, by the way, the sound of the creatures, that, like, duck-like sound, they Quack! sound like that, that's me. Uh-huh. But that was actually the sound guy says, uh, what I did is I recorded a hundred different kisses. Don't ask me anything else. I'll just uh, tell you is that the one I used is uh, what you got. <laughs> so, and he, like, sped it up. So that's actually a kiss sound. If you listen carefully, you guess it sounds like he's kissing his arm. Or at least that's what I'm supposing, and that's probably his story, and he's sticking with it. Uh, I do also like the fact that their phasers are pretty much worthless, and their technology can't determine what these creatures are. They're neither there, and they are there. What did you think of that as a concept? I thought it was really uh, very cool. It kind of re- reminded me of the, uh, the subspace uh, mines from a DS9 episode. Um, oh, the yeah, Houdini's? I thought it was- yeah. What'd you say? The Houdinis, the subspace mines. It's the yes. battle of uh, the AR-355 or something like that. Something like that, yeah. It stars, and it stars Bill Moomy, who was, uh, you know, the guy with psychic powers from the Twilight Zone, the, the little kid. But, yeah, I like that entire little thing that, that their technology isn't good, nothing works. It's that when after Spock has his, I guess you could say his affirmation, he decides to beam down to the planet, and then we learn what a badass Scotty is. I think that's actually pretty cool, where he, like, runs yeah. to the academy because, like, he goes, stay where you are, or I'll put you to sleep for sure. Freeze right there, Mr. Spock. Or I'll put you to sleep for sure. You wonder, is, yeah. is it is it on stun, or is it on kill? You know, I don't know. Scotty? Scotty's like, you know, you know how tough he is, as the memes on the internet say? He's the only red shirt to survive the entire series. <laughs> so... He's, Darn toot. Yeah, he's he's tough as nails, I'll tell you that much. But again, uh, Spock logics his way down to the planet. Mr. Spock, your logic, as usual, is inescapable. And uh, takes his, like, what I like to say, his uh, salad forks and uh, a container to capture the weird alien creatures. I mean, that's one way to catch an omelet. Sure, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> but, you know, I do like the fact that when Spock beams down, we see another person with a giant, I don't know, sardine can key trying to kill him. Um, but there's like this this hesitancy like before him. It's like there's the creatures inside itself recognize him. Uh, like they kind of like know that maybe I shouldn't attack this guy because he's already infected. Did you notice that? Yes. Yeah, that was, I did see that. That was actually supposed to be a more full character, but they cut it for time. It was a character who uh, was going to be chasing Spock with a bloodied axe saying, you'll have to kill me or I'll kill you. And Spock like pretty much shoots him. And this one, it's just a nerve pinch, which you think wouldn't work at this time. But I did like the um, the impromptu weapons they have here. They had uh, big, gigantic Lucite wands. <laughs> and we also had uh, this kind of weird, I don't know, skeleton key looking thing. Yeah, I- it, it it could be a it could be a, a giant uh, hex wrench. Uh, maybe they have big IKEA furniture on this planet or something. I don't know. 
I like that. It was pretty. It, it's some sort of engineering tool. That was really cool. But then uh, when they bring the creature back up, they realize that they can't destroy it with anything. They try radiation. They try heat. They try mm -hmm. all sort of. As McCoy says, is I, I burned it with something that would turn us all to ashes. And uh, Kirk's like, yeah, it's a big decision. And it, Kirk says, you know, I, I have to decide something because if we can't stop it here, I'm going to have to kill everyone on the planet. So that comes to our next scene where he's yelling at uh, Spock and McCoy like, I need a third option. This is ridiculous. We've got the most expensive computers or the smartest computers. I like the fact that he says expensive. Uh, I know. I was about to say, it's like, oh, man, it's it, full season in. We're at the end of the first season. They still haven't figured out the whole space communism thing yet. Hey, they they never figure out the space communism thing. That's ever. true. You're right. In DS9, you got people going in. You got Federation people going in and eating every day at Quarks. And you better believe that he's not doing that on credit. Yeah. Someone's paying him. Yeah. On Earth, I think Earth is paradise, according to Cisco in DS9. But like. There's no issue of like what money is, yet they have traders and they have trade agreements and there's trade goods and they have money. So it's a kind of weird thing. And it's and never that, really you've clearly... got people like John Luke, who has his own vineyard, and you've got people like Rafi who are living on a trailer. I'm like, yeah, well, I have a What's problem with here? that. I have a problem with that because at the time that happens, Earth's a paradise and no one's living in a trailer. So I, I call BS on but not Star Trek everyone Picard. can be living in, on a on a French vineyard. Well, that might be so, but not everyone. You don't have to live in a trailer and be a drug addict smoking cigarettes, which is one thing Roddenberry did not have. In fact, that says no smoking on the transporter room in Star Trek Two and in Star Trek One, the movie, mm. the motion picture. But anywho, that's where we're at. You know, they can't figure out what's going on, and so. They've tried. I like they had this final meeting in Kirk's quarters. They said, we've tried everything. Kirk's like, uh, well, you, you got to give me something. And Spock's saying, I request permission to beam down with your nephew so you can kill us all. And <laughs> and, and, and like Kirk's like, I don't know. Tell me, uh, what are the properties of the sun? Because that Denovan uh, went to the sun. And Spock goes through like the really basic list. It exists. It has mass. It has uh, radiation. And then... Kirk hits some sort of beepy thing. He goes, what about light? Oh, yeah. That's the most that, obvious thing. <laughs> I'm about to say, that kind of comes out of nowhere. I'm like, well, okay, yeah, how about light? Nothing leaks up about light. Not to us. But down on the surface, the creatures stayed in the shadows for the most part. Suppose that they weren't simply hiding. Suppose they're sensitive to light. Light like in a sun, close up. And it's not like those things are actually really in the shadows. I guess they're like... You know, they're not just uh, in dark places. If they were trying to do that, it wasn't very well telegraphed. Yeah, I mean, because they're on a well-lit set, but they're but they're not outside, I think is what they're trying to say. So they're inside a in uh, in houses. They have one throwaway line about how everyone's hiding, everyone's quiescent and in, the, in, in hiding inside. So those flying things, that was like a, I don't know, an open air inside patio area, but with like uh, no no windows, I guess. So, yeah. you know, but they discover it's light. And then we come to the part where Roddenberry gets involved. So DC Fontana added the stinger. Karabatsis borrowed from Archons, basically a whole mishmash of various things. I was about to say a bunch of people being uh, violent and controlled. Exactly. You've got, you've got a little bit of the proto-Borg in here, which you also have in the Archons. That you sure do. We have a, an alien race that is essentially one giant being yes. with various cells. That's actually the first time that's kind of done in a way, for well, specifically for Star Trek. But I actually like that concept still. Again, that's like the Flood from Halo. It is like the Puppet Masters, and it is like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, except uh, less <laughs> communisty. So... That's that's what this is, but we come to the part where they use light because originally they were going to uh, nuke the planet, like I said. And Bob Justman said, "Did you run this past NBC? I'm pretty sure they're not going to want us killing everybody." Is the last uh, episode of the season, and so then that's yeah, when they seriously. changed it. So Roddenberry added the more hopeful ending by using the solar radiation to uh, kill these creatures. They apparently die by certain light. 
But this is the part that I always find ridiculous. They this set up, is the part that you this, find ridiculous. This part and no other of this episode. This is the Go WTF on. moment for me. So they set up this entire chamber. They give a full white light to the creature. And it's good to know that they still count things in strength of candles. In the, tw- in the I know, right? Century. A million candlelight. I'm like, oh, right. okay. Yeah, but that's not the weird part. So they destroy it, and instead of waiting for the lab results, they immediately throw Spock in. Like, you can't wait five minutes. It's just five minutes, you know? Yeah. You know, Chapel couldn't, like, suddenly come out and like, hey, here's the results. The results say use this. Oh, I won't have to try and blind Spock. Uh, the part that I'm talking about, which between that is my WTF and also how what happens to Spock, he loses his eyesight and like, oh my god, and McCoy's like, he's the best first officer in the fleet but oh well, now he's totally blind the creature within me is gone I am free of it, and the pain and I'm also quite blind and <laughs> that, in the meantime they take all these satellites out they launch them, that's added into the enhanced version over here uh, of Star Trek uh, before it was just them telling you that. So you get to see these uh, CGI satellites being launched and then shooting uh, light onto the planet, which melts the creatures away, which also makes you wonder, what happens if you work really low below ground? Or what happens well, if... Also, the- I mean, like, the entire planet is bleached everywhere, every moment, every every square inch. I guess everyone has open-air malls. I don't know. Uh- by the way, the chair that Spock is sitting in when they go give it to him is actually the chair from Dagger of the Mind. So there you also have mind control from that, too. So they reused everything for this episode. Uh, the, huh. part, the part that Roddenberry used is when Spock comes out to the bridge, like, you're okay. What happened? Well, I have this third inner eyelid like you guys have an appendix. So, you know. I can see! I can see! That's okay. But I don't know. At a million candlelights, I'm calling BS on that one. But whatever. Uh, it does, Those uh, inner eyelids do make a future appearance in uh, 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 TNG somewhere. I just can't remember which episode. So about to say, we don't see anything about the Vulcans other than their ears that looks <laughs> alien, unless they bleed. Or maybe it's actually from Enterprise, because they're talking about how bright it is on the planet uh, Vulcan on one of the fourth season episodes. And they have, oh, we have inner eyelids, so... That's what that is. That's, I think, a cheap way of ending it, but a positive way. Sure. You know, instead of staying there and saying, let's see if everyone's okay, let's go back to the Starbase. Uh, we'll just send somebody later. But that's pretty much the entire ending of it. That It's a short story, even though it's, you know, still 45 minutes. It's not technically a, a series or a season finale. It's just the last episode, which in this time in television, that's the way things are. Um, and that's that's pretty much about it. Uh, any impressions of their solution or the ending or anything like this? It was a fine episode. Underwritten. Kirk's brother being in there was pointless. They should have just had him and his brother working together. So that way you could see, you know, that would, would have been a little bit of an interesting looking behind the curtain of seeing more about what that, that each of these people on here, they've got pasts and stories and... Um, you know they're they're not just uh, monoliths. Uh, we didn't we don't get to see much of these little brain cell things. We don't understand many much of them. Yeah, honestly, nothing much happens in this episode, Captain. And well, compared to the other ones, I mean, listen, um, the Moroccan yeoman was the best part. Hey, well, I mean, there were things happening. There was an alien that invaded a planet, and they killed it all. This was uh, the first appearance and only appearance of a specific director, Herschel Doherty. He directed other things like Have Gun, Will Travel, Wagon Train, Outer Limits, a whole bunch of things. So I think he did a good job. But because they were running behind from the city on the edge of forever, that he had two days extra of prep and two days extra of shooting. So that's something nice. So... You could see a somewhat less rushed kind of way of them doing stuff. And the other thing, as always, is how much did this cost? Well, this was 100. Let me guess. Yes. Ah, damn, you said 100. I, I, didn't th- I thought it was going to come under budget. Uh, nope. <laughs> we gotta, wait, wait, just wait. Um, there are a lot. I mean, that's the thing, too. This episode, compared to City on the Edge of Forever, compared to Danger in the Dark... Devil in the Dark. Oh, God. So little happens here. 
and so much happened in the other ones. Um, okay, I'm going to say this was a hundred and... Okay, we had a lot of the exteriors. We had a fair amount of extras, a couple of shots, creatures. Uh, 195,000. Really close, Mike. It's $196,780. And that translates today to $1,850,998.70. And the <laughs> best... Reminded me... You yes. Now, it, it, the best part is, is well, here, it, this, this episode was $11,780 over budget in 1967 dollars, or $110,807.83 over. So what does that remind you of? The jerk, where there, everything was like in two cents at the end, or what? No, this actually reminds me of a, a Dave Attell, not Dave Chappelle, but Dave Attell mm-hmm. um, comedy bit. Where he says, I went to the opera, and I thought to myself, look how much talent it takes to bore me. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. I'm like, oh, look how much money it made for me to go, meh. Oh, come on. And the effect of the melting, that was kind of cool. Uh, that was the, good. The egg things. But between Star Trek and Mission Impossible, Desilu was rapidly running out of money. Because Mission Impossible also was running over budget all the time, and... You had to pay for the stars going between the episodes, the special effects, right. the location shots, the sets themselves. They're almost right next door to each other on the Paramount Studio, or Desilu Studio, rather. So that's pretty much it. That's the end of Star Trek Season 1. So before uh, anything else you want to add about this story that you want to add before we give our very scientific 1 to 10 scale on this one? <sighs> Always nice to see them. I dug the location. I don't have much else to say. I can go straight to my thing. Sure, go ahead. Don't count five. the yeoman. <laughs> oh, it's with oh, the yeoman. No, I did. It would have been a four, but the yeoman made it five. <laughs> I don't know, man. I got eyes for her. She's a cutie. She sure is. But uh, I'm going to go up on you on this one. I'm going to give this one a seven. I actually like this one. Seven? Yeah, I kind of like it a lot. I like, it. I like the campiness of the egg flying creatures. I like the fact that... Uh, we don't know what it is. We've got the aliens taking over human bodies. It's kind of a little bit of the body horror. Uh, I really, I guess I really like the TRW uh, campus, but I like the idea of this weird alien form coming over, taking over a colony, and, you know, uh, making people do stuff against their will. It's kind of like Landrew, but I like it, the fact that there were these creepy egg things. For some reason, I, I just like it. That's why I give it a seven. That's just me. It looked good, but we had no... At least Landrew had a, some manner of explanation. Are you dare... Are you dare saying bad things about Landrew? Don't make no, me... I'm saying it was better. It was better <laughs> than this. As long as I... You know, because if you keep making fun of Landrew, I'll be sending you on shore leave to hang out with Finnegan, and you don't want yeah. that, my... <laughs> oh, cute music, I'm sure. Yes. I, and then, you know, you have that cute little banter at the end. But I, I do like the, the, the banter between Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. It just, again, just hones in how they have a great relationship but uh that's it what did you think of your uh, first season of uh, star trek uh first season of 1966 Much than i expected and you know they've i've they've said it multiple times and i reiterate um probably the best first season of star trek there is right yeah yeah i would better than i would ds9 yes and uh definitely better than tng oh god and yes. <laughs> has aged less than the tng is is less dated than the tng um, you know, took some time. There were some shaky episodes where I'm sure that they were just, uh, I don't know, rushed and missing the bigger picture and not really understanding their own concept. And then you had some episodes which were like on par with A plus sci fi films of the times. Yeah, that's that's that comes in from having good science fiction writers on there and. You can badmouth uh, Roddenberry's writing, but he did have a great idea, and he did have some good stories in here. There's a combination of cheese. and But what I think that makes Star Trek resonate even to this day, from 1966 to when we're recording oh, yes. this in 2024, is there's a message of hope. Uh, humanity is no longer a, a race uh, obsessed with killing each other. I mean, you could say, well, now we're obsessed with killing aliens, but that's not even the case here. No. There's no killing aliens here if they can help it. Uh, there's an organization that's trying to do something. And even as it's we're seeing, like, 
the nascent construction of the Federation and the bigger ideas, which wasn't all Roddenberry's idea. You had help with Gene Kuhn and Robert Justman, etc., and Herb Solo, also another producer. You have all these people in the background putting this together. It wasn't just the great bird of the galaxy's idea, which is Justman's name for Roddenberry, but <laughs> it gave a idea of a cohesive human society where we all work together. It's not a, a question of color or a question of religion or any ethic, ethnic creed. We're all one race, and we're working together to make a common goal. And these are people exploring and finding out what's out there. And in that and through these stories, we explore little aspects of ourselves. It makes you think through allegory. And that's why I think Star Trek, especially season one, is some of the best Star Trek there is. And it's superior to a lot of other shows that are out there, and it still resonates with me. That's just my feeling, and that's why it always makes me feel good to watch this stuff. So, um, Very well said, Captain. Thank you very much for that insight. That well, was some A-plus rant. Yeah, it's, Not rant, commentary. It's commentary. It's, uh, well, thank you. Thank you, XO. But uh, anything you want to add to that? Um, just to say that it's been a great exploration, and... <laughs> Honestly, the the great thing about Star Trek is that we've got plenty more ahead of us. Be more sure highs, can. more lows, many different places. And, uh, Captain, I'm looking forward to doing it. For uh, This is the first of many milestones, hopefully. And uh, let's get that video episode out there. The people want to see our handsome faces. Uh, well, well, we'll work on that. Well, I do know our next episode, we're just going to do our – we're going to do our top five each – and just do a quick one on that. We could do that on next time of Yelling at Gaseous Anomalies. And then we'll be yes. starting in on our next episode for uh, episode one of season two, which will be a special one. It's called A Mock Time. And we'll see you next time on Yelling at Gaseous Anomalies. And Mike, anything you want to say to our fine, fair listeners out there? Um, live long and prosper. Next episode, I actually took a little glimpse of. All I'm going to say is, holy Jesus. What a wig. <laughs> you'll you'll know it when you see it. It's a good and, episode. Um, <laughs> yes. Lovely as always, Captain. Thank you for joining me on this uh, and inviting me on this journey. Looking forward to season two. I look forward to doing season two with you and our recap. And again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us at yellingatgas at gmail.com. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and find us on all your podcatchers out there. And don't forget our Tee Public uh, t-shirt store and buy some nice-looking merch so you can help support the channel. And as yeah. always, yeah, you want to have a styling t-shirt. As always, live long and prosper and see you out there. I said, please don't tell Spock that I said he was the best first officer in the fleet. Why, thank you, Dr. McCoy. You've been so concerned about his Vulcan eyes, Doctor. You forgot about his Vulcan ears. <laughs>